Let me invite you to turn in your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 4. Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 4. I don't know if I've ever preached a sermon on just one verse, so I'm going to try it today. In Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 4. And you probably noticed that this is a sermon on fathers, and I actually didn't plan that. (laughs) That was the Lord's providence that... um, He matched this sermon text up on Father's Day. Let me invite you to stand as we honor the reading of God's holy and inspired words. And let me remind you, dear church, that when the Bible speaks, God speaks. So may we approach the reading of his word with reverence and awe. Paul says in verse 4, Fathers, Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father, Isaiah 55 reminds us that your word will not return to you void. Lord, we need the preaching of your word this morning. We ask that with your Holy Spirit's help, you will teach us just this one verse. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I know that you, like me, are big fans of country music. Right? One of the greatest country music artists of all times is George Strait. And one of George Strait's most famous songs is the song, Love Without End, Amen. Have you heard that song, Love Without End, Amen? I believe it was the number one country music song in the world back in 1990. Let me just read to you the opening verse and then the chorus. The opening verse, I got sent home from school one day with a shiner on my eye. Fighting was against the rules and it didn't matter why. When dad got home, I told that story just like I'd rehearsed and then stood there on those trembling knees and I waited for the worst. So the son is scared to death of his daddy. And in the chorus, the dad talks to the son and here's what the dad says. He says, let me tell you a secret about a father's love, a secret that my daddy said was just between us. He says, daddies don't just love their children every now and then. It's a love without end. Amen. It's a love without end. Amen. So in the song, as I'm sure a lot of you know that particular song, the boy knows he's made a big mistake by fighting at school. And the boy gets home and he's really expecting his old man to punish him. But instead, the dad responds with love and says that daddies always love their children. And it's a love without end. Amen. And even if you don't like country music, I'm sure we can all appreciate the message of that song about the unconditional love that a father is to have for his children. And I quote that song because, as you've surely noticed by now, verse 4 is all about fathers and parenting. Uh, Today's verse is all about how to be a godly father and therefore a godly parent. We've been doing a sermon series from the book of Ephesians entitled, Focus on the Family. We've discussed how to be a godly wife back in Ephesians 5, 22 through 24. We've discussed how to be a godly husband in Ephesians 5, 25 through 33. We've discussed how to raise godly children a couple weeks ago in chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. And today, in just one short verse, the Apostle Paul tells us how to be a godly father and a godly parent. And look, look. We need to know how to be a godly father and a godly parent. We need Ephesians 6, verse 4. We need this one little single individual verse. It's true that every person in the nuclear family is important. That's true. But listen, there's something extremely important about the father, isn't there? There's something extremely important about the dad. 
One leading Christian magazine writes this about fathers. In America, it's become increasingly harder to find a father in the home. 24 million children in America, that's one out of every three children, now live in a home in which the biological father is absent. Increasing father involvement in their children's lives is one of the most important ways to address the material and spiritual poverty in this country. One way we can do that is to reiterate the importance of fathers and the difference that their presence makes. Almost every study conducted in the social sciences confirms what the Bible already teaches. Fathers matter. Fathers matter. And we all need to know what a godly father looks like. Even if you're not a man, even if you're not a husband or a father, we all need to know what a godly father looks like. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't have put this verse in the Bible, right? Today's verse comes to us in two parts. If you look on the back flap of your bullets, in two parts. First, what not to do as a father. And then second, what to do as a father. So we get a negative command and then a positive command. So first, we're given a negative command of what not to do as a father there in the first part of verse 6. Paul simply says what? Fathers do not provoke your children to anger. Fathers do not provoke your children to anger. You'll notice that the word fathers is used there in verse 4. And basically all Bible translations translate the word here as fathers, which is the most literal translation of the Greek term pateris. pateris. But although the word fathers is used, Paul probably has in mind both mothers and fathers as they rear their children, especially given the broader context. Look back at verses 1 through 2 of chapter 6. Paul says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. And he says, honor your father and your mother, that it may go well with you. So Paul is probably talking to both parents, but he's placing a special, unique emphasis on the father. Why is that? Why is the good apostle placing a special emphasis upon the dad? Why focus on the father specifically? Well, it's because the father is the leader of the family. The father is the provider of the family. The father is the head of the house. The father is the protector of the family. The father is the God-ordained covenant leader of his family. The father, as the Puritans used to say, is the master of the house. And when it comes to rearing children, both parents, mom and dad, are essential. Both are essential. But there's something really incredibly important about a father, isn't there? It's the father who leads the ship. It's the father who guides the family. It's the father who directs and manages the family. He, he's the pater familius, as we often say. So fathers, let me talk to you for a second. You need to know that God has placed you in a special role as the head of your home. And it's a role that you can never, ever take lightly. Let's dive into verse 4a. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. In its original context, why would Paul give this command? What would have been going through the minds of the Ephesians as they came across this verse? What prompted Paul to give such a command for fathers not to provoke their children to anger? Well, let's put it this way. The Ephesians would have been very familiar with Roman culture and Roman customs. And we know from history that Roman fathers could be violent, ruthless, cruel, and harsh. During this time, during the writing of the book of Ephesians, a Roman father could kill his own children much in the same way that he could kill his own slave. This is what one historian writes about fathers, Roman fathers during this time. He says, by Roman law, a father had virtual life and death power over his entire household. He could cast any of them out of his house. He could sell them as slaves. 
or even kill them and be accountable to no one. A newborn child was placed at its father's feet to determine its fate. If the father picked the child up, he was allowed to live. If the father walked away, the newborn was disposed of. Discarded infants were taken to the town forum where they could be picked up and raised as slaves or prostitutes. Uh, Oftentimes, newborn boys were allowed to live and newborn girls were sold into slavery or prostitution. Seneca, Seneca, who was a Roman philosopher living during Paul's day, once said this about fathers and children. Listen, Listen to what he says. He says, we slaughter a fierce ox, we strangle a mad dog, we plunge a knife into a sick cow, and children who are born weak or deformed, we drown. So this command, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, would have been revolutionary during this time. This would have hit the ears of the Ephesians in a unique and special way. This is countercultural stuff that Paul is writing. And by the way, that's a good point to remember that Christianity often uh, offers us countercultural stuff, doesn't it? Now, maybe you're thinking, all right, Tabor, sheesh, these Roman fathers could be quite cruel and harsh. We got it, but we're American fathers. We're not Romans. So how does this relate to us? Well, it's true that we aren't Roman, but I think it's a tendency of fathers, a tendency of fathers in general to be harsh with their families and with their children when they get upset. There certainly are harsh mothers out there, but there's probably more harsh fathers than mothers. Now look, I'm not saying, and I don't think Paul's saying, that all fathers are are mean, cruel, ruthless, rotten, bad Joes. I'm not saying that all fathers are just as mean as they ever could be. But I think Paul is saying that men can lean towards this tendency in their sin. Men can have a tendency to be harsh. I mean, we all recognize that men are physically and uh, physically stronger and more muscular than most women and children. Men have more testosterone and strength and stamina and mass than most women and children. And I think that if fathers aren't careful, if they aren't careful, they can be overly domineering and overly authoritarian and even harsh to their families. I think it's just one of the effects of sin that we men have to guard against. That's why Paul says over in Colossians 3.19, the parallel passage, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. What does it mean to provoke someone? Notice how Paul says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. What what does it mean to provoke someone? Well, it just means to push somebody over the line, right? It means to irritate or to exasperate somebody. It means to engage in a repeated, ongoing, continual, for lack of a better term, nagging of someone, right? And apparently, Paul's saying that if fathers aren't careful, they can provoke their children to what? To anger. Colossians 3.21, the parallel passage. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. So anger and discouragement. And to provoke a child to anger or discouragement means that you're harsh and domineering and authoritarian with them to the extent that it crushes the child's spirit. It causes the child to lose heart. It causes them to be exasperated, discouraged, resentful, and it can drive them to anger. What are some ways, what are some ways that fathers can provoke their children to anger? What are some ways that fathers can provoke their children to resentment and to be angry? Speaking of country music songs, do you know what country music song best captures a father uh, provoking his son to anger? That's Johnny Cash's song, A Boy Named Sue. You know that one? Surely from North Carolina, you know A Boy Named Sue. In that song, a mean father names his son Sue. That's a woman's name. And it causes the boy trouble throughout his whole life. I grew up quick. I grew up mean. My fists got hard. My wits got keen. I'd roam from town to town to hide my shame. 
But I made a vow to the moon and stars that I'd search the honky-tonks and the bars and I'd kill the man who gave me that awful name, Sue, right? The boy was angry his whole life because his daddy gave him a girl's name. You know that song, right? On a more serious note, let me give you some several, uh, several ways how we can provoke our children to anger. I'm going to list several ways that we can provoke our children to anger. And I'm going to go through these quickly, so, so hang on. One way that we can provoke our children to anger is through overprotection. Overprotection. Like what one pastor says on this point of overprotection. Well-meaning overprotection is a common cause of resentment in children. Parents who smother their children, overly restrict where they can and what they cannot do, who never trust them to do things on their own, can produce resentful and angry children. Yes, he says, children need careful guidance and certain restrictions, but they are individual human beings in their own right, and they must learn to make decisions on their own, as their age and maturity allows. He says their wills can be guided, but never controlled. So I think overprotection can push children to anger. Another way that we can provoke our children to anger is by comparing them to other children. Comparing them to other children. Either other siblings in the family or maybe other children from other families. Man, I wish Timmy was as good a soccer player as his buddy Tommy. I wish Susie Q could play the trombone as good as her friend Sarah Jane. I wish Jimmy could be the homecoming king just like his friend Johnny. I wish Sally Mae had the grade that her friend Mary Lou Ellen has. I tried to stick with good Southern names there if you, if you didn't catch that. So, so comparing our kids to other kids. Another way that we can provoke our children to anger is by having unreasonable expectations when it comes to their achievements. We can often have unreasonable expectations when it comes to their grades, their athletic abilities, their musical talents, and so on and so forth. Now, obviously, we want young Timmy to be a good football player. We want Susie Q to be the homecoming queen. We do, and it's okay for our to have high expectations for our children. That's okay. But we don't want to pressure our children into achieving things that ultimately can destroy them and it can overburden them and, and drive them to anger and to resentment. So unreasonable expectations when it comes to achievements. Another way that we can provoke our children is through discouragement, discouraging them. A children need rigorous discipline, as we're about to see, and as we saw a couple weeks ago. But they also need constant love and encouragement, don't they? If all we ever do is get on to our children, this can breed discouragement and frustration, bitterness, and I think eventually anger. It can crush a child's spirit. Uh, Martin Luther, during the Reformation, once said, spare the rod and spoil the child. That's true. But beside the rod, keep an apple at hand to give to the child when he has done well. So discouragement can drive our children to anger. Another way that we can provoke our children to anger is through physical or verbal abuse. Again, mothers are certainly capable of this, but I think uh, fathers may especially struggle with this. If we're not careful, fathers can tend to be harsh. A parent should never be physically or verbally abusive to their children. Doing so is not only ungodly and mean, but it can provoke them to anger and to resentment. And I would add that any father who physically abuses his children is a coward. and He needs to be in jail. There's a gajillion other ways that we can provoke our children to anger. Inconsistent discipline. Withdrawing from them. Not loving on them. Forcing them to grow up too fast. And many, many more things. But that's the negative command. That's what we're not to do as fathers, fathers. We're not to provoke our children to anger. Look second with me, if you will, on your outline to the positive command. Second, you'll notice how verse 4 gives us a positive command. Here's what you are to do as a godly father. And we're still on verse 4, by the way. 
Paul says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. That's the negative command. Here's the positive one. Instead, I want you to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. If you look at your bulletin, I've broken verse 4b down into two parts. M&M, m and the mandate and the method. The mandate, the method. What's the mandate? What's the command? What, what are you to do, fathers? Well, it's for you, fathers, but I think this applies also to all parents. It's for you to bring them up. You are to bring up your children. What's that mean? What's it mean to bring your children up? Well, to bring them up means to rear them. It means to nurture them. It means to come alongside them and raise them and play an active role in their development. To bring them up means that you you help them and you be with them and you be near them as they grow and mature. It means that you push them along and you actively play a role in their lives and you steer them and guide them toward the truth. I think what Paul is saying when he says to bring them up, it means that there's no such thing as hands-off parenting where the kids are allowed to just do whatever they want to do. No, they must be brought up and steered and directed and guided. That, that's the mandate, parents, and especially fathers. It's to bring up your children. What's the method? In other words, how are you to bring them up? How are you to go about raising your children? What, what's the method that verse 4 gives us? Well, the apostle Paul gives us a method. He says, I want you to do it in, in how? The discipline and instruction of of the Lord. That's a threefold method right there, isn't it? Discipline, instruction, godliness in the Lord. Discipline, instruction, godliness. Paul says, I want you to bring them up in discipline. There's a couple ways to understand the the phrase discipline there. One way to understand the word discipline is to me is to take it to mean that children need penalization and punishment when they mess up. In other words, they need admonition when they don't do the right thing. They need to be punished and penalized when they don't do what mom and dad asked them to do. Another way to understand the word discipline there is to take it to mean that children need training, strict training. Uh, Like athletes, like athletes who need strict training regimens, children need structure and routine training and discipline as they age, and mature. I think there's probably a sense that Paul means both, though. In other words, they do need punishment when they mess up, but they also need strict training to help them stay on course. That's the first part of the method, discipline, Paul says. Another part of the method is what? Instruction. And here the word instruction in Greek means to put something in one's mind. To put something in one's mind. In other words, fathers, we have to put godly information in the minds of our children. And this godly information, this godly instruction should spill over into their behavior and their practice. Uh, Parents, especially fathers, let me talk to you for a second. We have to instruct our children in scripture, in rigorous catechetical training, and in godly Christian living. A children need instruction because they don't just randomly know these things. They don't just randomly know the Bible or doctrine or godly living. They don't come out of the womb hardwired uh, to know scripture, doctrine, and godly living. They got to learn. They got to be instructed in these things. And look at me, husbands and fathers, look. This is ultimately your duty. This is ultimately your obligation. Yes, Mama can and should help. But fathers, it's primarily your duty as the man and the leader and the provider of the family to instruct your children. Elsewhere, the Bible is clear that children need instruction in Scripture, catechism, and godly living. I'm going to rattle off a few passages here, a few parallel passages. You might want to write these down or just listen as I go through them. Back in Genesis 18, 19, God says that he's chosen Abraham so that he, Abraham, may command his children and his household to keep the ways of the Lord. 
Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, the famous Shema. Moses says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He says, I want you to teach these things diligently to your children. I want you to talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You need to bind these things as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. In other words, Moses is saying you need to instruct your children in the ways of the Lord. Sadly, sadly, in Judges 2.10, we are told that there arose another generation who did not know the Lord that he had, in the work that he had done in Israel. In other words, the children of the generation in Canaan didn't receive solid instruction. Their parents didn't do their duties. They didn't do their job. And there arose another generation that didn't know the things of the Lord. Over in 1 Samuel 3.13, Eli's sons, you'll remember Eli's sons were killed because they didn't receive godly instruction and they were blaspheming the Lord's name. Psalm 78 is a didactic psalm about instructing the next generation in the faith, telling them the things of the Lord. Psalm 78.4 says, We will not hide these things from our children. We're going to tell the coming generation about the glorious deeds of God. Proverbs 22.6, Train up a child in the way he should go. 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul says that Timothy received biblical instruction from childhood. The passage says that from childhood, Timothy was acquainted with the sacred writings. So Scripture tells us, fathers, over and over again, that children need rigorous instruction in the things of the Lord. Again, they're not hardwired to know these things. Someone's got to teach them and tell them and instruct them. And that especially falls on the shoulders of of the Father. You know, during the Protestant Reformation, our Reformed forefathers put a hearty emphasis on scripture memorization, catechetical training, and godly Christian living. Uh, one of my favorite pieces of Reformation art is a painting of Martin Luther. He's holding some sort of guitar looking thing. I don't know what it is, but he's leading his family in family worship. It's a, it's a great picture. Google it when you have a chance. During the Reformation and the post-Reformation periods, children were expected to have large chunks of Scripture memorized. They were expected to have the Ten Commandments and the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer memorized early in life. They were expected to know the Heidelberg Catechism or Calvin's uh, Geneva Catechism. Later, when the Puritans came along, children were expected to memorize the Westminster Shorter Catechism, and adults were to know the larger catechism. So our biblical forefathers, but also our Reformed forefathers, took Ephesians 6, 4 utterly seriously, that children need training in, in Scripture, doctrine, and godly Christian living. And again, this comes ultimately from the Father. Sadly, sadly today, most children, most Christian children, I believe, receive a fraction of all the necessary instruction, even in the Reformed faith. The Reformed Presbyterian tradition in America, in my opinion, is experiencing a watering down of biblical and catechetical instruction. Today, parents, today, fathers, our parents need, or our children need more, not less training in Bible, catechism, and instruction in godly living. While American Christian children are memorizing video games and iPhones, oftentimes many Muslim children are memorizing large portions of the Quran, and they often know Christianity better than Christian children do. While American Christian children are memorizing Facebook, Snapchat, and Instagram, many Mormon children have rigorous seminary training in their own homes. And those Mormons often know Christianity better than Christian children do. Christian children, in my pastoral opinion, are behind in their religious instruction. And a lot of it comes back to the parents, especially to the fathers who won't instruct their children. So parents and fathers, 
It is your job to instruct your children. It's your joyful duty. It's your joyful duty to do so. Make them memorize the Ten Commandments. Make them memorize the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer. Teach them how to pray. Get on your knees with them and teach them how to pray. Teach them that church attendance is not optional. Teach them that observing the entirety of the Lord's day is not optional. Teach them to serve the church. Teach them, most importantly, to know the gospel. Tell them the plain facts of the gospel of Christ. And since we're talking about the gospel, let me discuss the gospel for a second. The gospel is is the, the fact that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life in obedience to God. He died as a a substitute for our sins on the cross. He was raised on the third day. And children, if you're here today and you don't know Christ, or if anyone, if you're here today and don't know Christ, you need to place your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus. Maybe some of you are saying, Sheesh, Tabor, this sounds like a lot of work. That's a lot of a-, a lot to ask of us to have our children memorize the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, to be trained in apologetics and all that. That's a lot, Tabor. To which I say, yeah, so? Yeah, so? It's a lot of work to instruct the next generation. But the bar is up here, parents. The bar is not down here. The stakes are up here, not down here. We are talking about the next generation of Christian children. And by the way, let me build our church up. I know there's some visitors here. Covenant ARP has some great children's ministries. We have a good Sunday school curriculum and good teachers. We have good catechism training and we have a good VBS that's starting up here in a few weeks. So spread the word about VBS. Uh, Parents, make sure you take uh, our children's, children's church material and reinforce it at home. Don't just throw those arts and crafts away and make sure you study those things and reinforce them at home. And by the way, fathers and parents, you can make scripture memorization, catechism, and godly Christian living fun. You can reward them and give them treats and snow cones and all sort of sugary drinks when they succeed. So you can make these things fun as they grow and mature. The last method is that our Discipline and instruction should be what? Of the Lord, right? That last little phrase, in the Lord, of the Lord. In other words, all this instruction, all this uh, discipline should be for the Lord's glory, honor, and adoration. Teach your children the opening question of the shorter catechism. What is man's chief end? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. John MacArthur, I've been quoting MacArthur a lot lately. He says, the key to right discipline and instruction of our children is its being of the Lord. Everything parents do for their children is to be for the Lord. According to the teachings of his word, by the guidance and power of his spirit, in the name of Christ, and to the Lord's own glory and honor. Earlier in my sermon, I alluded to a research study which said that almost every study conducted in the social sciences confirms what the Bible already teaches. Fathers matter. And I would just add one little caveat to that. Godly fathers matter. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord in heaven, for this one short little verse. I pray that you would write these things in our hearts. Let us discuss these things in our homes. Most importantly, let us live by them for your glory. This we ask in Christ's name and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.